Okay, good morning. So we have uh, in Parashas Kiseitse. So Kiseitse, Kiteitse. When you get to this Parsha, you already know, you're like, okay, it's getting real. We're getting close to Rosh Hashanah. You just know that. And you kind of have the, the feeling that like summer is going to become a memory before we know it. I don't, I don't care what anybody says, but this summer was shorter than any summer in the world. Uh, because when you have Rosh Hashanah on Labor Day, it just, you don't have any buffer. The, the kids, I think, are starting school before Labor Day, so they can get, you know, those three hours in before they have nine weeks off for Yuntif, however it works. But, um, we, you know, it's here. We, you know, when we're, 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 it's already, it's the ninth day of Elul. So, you know, we have 21 days or whatever it is till Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's, it's, it's three weeks from now will be Rosh Hashanah. There's nothing I can do about it. But when we say Kiseita, we also associate it with probably the, the Parsha that has the highest amount of mitzvos concentrated in the Parsha. And one could probably write a doctoral thesis on trying to find interconnectivity from one to the next to the next. I'll be a very hard doctor to write, in my opinion. Some have tried it. Some are easier to connect than others. Uh, some are a little bit more complicated to connect with the others, but what I want to do, I want to examine uh, at the very end of the Parsha, something that seems to be unrelated, but yet the Mephar should make a connection. So I, I sent out the sources, I'll put it on the screen in a second. We're going to look at mostly at a Klayakar. Um, the Klayakar on, on Devarim is just phenomenal. I mean, all this form, but on Devarim specifically, I think is just phenomenal. We're flying lunches. And at the end of the Parsha, so the very end on we always remember the announcing. I, I like, I see things as pages, you know, I like, cause I'm always announcing pages. My kids, when they were young, they asked, somebody asked, what does your father do like for a living? And they, one of them actually answered, he announces pages in shul, which, you know, I guess, I guess there are worse things to be known for. Um, we, <laughs> When I'm not recording, I'm going to tell you a different story about a different parent, but uh, <laughs> ask, remind me to ask you about Josh Stein. Um, so the, uh, the, the last part we remember, because we know the Battle of Hastings, 1066, is, this, is the Zechir Uh It's what we read on Parsha Zachor, and we read it again. And some shuls are actually quite uh, meticulous, scrupulous, and they'll say, if anybody missed Parsha Zachor, you should have in mind when we read it now to, to hear the reading. And we have, of course, remember what Hashem did to Amalek um, when you left Egypt. And he, of course, they, they, he, they happened upon you on the way. They struck those that were in the rear and the weaklings at your rear. You were faint and you were tired. You didn't fear God. Unclear who didn't fear God. It shall be that when Hashem your God gives you a rest from all your enemies all around, in the land that Hashem gives you as inheritance to possess, you're going to wipe out the memory of Amalek. Timche Zecher Amalek, of course, we Zecher Zecher. Well, question, do we do that in this week's parasha also? When we read it, we just read it Zecher. We don't do a Zecher Zecher. Um, don't forget. So it's, you should wipe out, don't forget. Well, if you wipe them out, how do you not forget? You know, so, it seems very uncharacteristic type of mitzvah. I mean, after all, we're Jews, we're such peace-loving people, we don't hurt anybody, and then it's one of the first mitzvahs that were commanded that when they had to go into the land of Israel, they had to conquer the, and divide the land, and they had to destroy Amalek, get rid of Amalek. Now, anybody who's a student of Tanakh, anyone who's a student of the Navi, and they're going to tell you that, oh, the Jews are so nice and they walk into places and they say, please and thank you. That's not the case, okay? It's, it's like murder and mayhem. There's a lot of obliteration that goes on and kicking people out. For better or for worse, you like it or not, that's what it is. So uh, the notion that, oh, we don't have this mitzvah to get rid of Amalek, and of course, it's the story with Shaul and Agag and the story of Haman and Mordechai, which we've examined a number of times here in this setting, but that's the mitzvah nonetheless. We have to get rid of Amalek. So much so that we have a mitzvah to remember it. We say it out loud and we put a mullik in the bottom of our shoe and hum on and we stamp on it. And, okay. What's interesting, what I, what I want to connect it to, though, is the Parsha that immediately precedes it, which, by the way, it's ironic, is that the Parsha of Amalek, which we kind of don't associate with Judaism, and the Torah has to come in as the Parsha before, with which, unfortunately, we very much associate with Judaism 
in not a most positive way. And let's look at it. So if you look, if you're, if you're in the art scroll on page 1064, the, the Torah tells us, um, you can't have in your pouch a weight and a weight, a large one and a small one. You can't have in your house different types of measures, a large one and a small one. A perfect and honest weight you should have, perfect and honest measure. Why? Because if you're going to have long days, God's going to give you arichas yamim, long days that on the land that God gives you. Because in the eyes of Hashem, it's an abomination, anybody who acts corruptly. In other words, you have to have, you have, to have uh, honest weights and measures, right? Now, so going to how I introduced this parsha is that unfortunately, you know, we end up on the front pages of the papers, not for the right reasons, you know, because of, of Ponzi schemes and uh, all types of, you know, infractions that, <laughs> so... <laughs> It's a it's it's an ongoing thing that you know, especially in certain communities where we're very uh, meticulous and scrupulous. If I could use those words again in this session about, about oh, you know, Dolores, you have to like ha- log off yeah. of one. I see you're on one and not the other. That's because that's why we're getting the feedback. Or I'll, I'll just mute you. Um, that the the you know we're very careful about the Orachayim mitzvahs. Very careful about you know how we daven and how we shuckle, but we're not careful about how we act in business. Not good. In other words, we have to be equally careful in every aspect of Shulchan Aruch, in every section. So the last thing that we're told here is Evan Shlema, and the last, it, it, it's, it's the penultimate section, and the last thing is Amalek. Is there any sort of connection between Amalek and um, Evan Shlema? By the way, just as, as an aside, the Vilna Gon, the Vilna Gon wrote a sefer on Hashkafa. He wrote a book on sort of Jewish outlook called Evan Shalema or Evan Shlomo, really. Uh, but it's really based on this Evan Shalema. Now, the reason he did so, the Vilna Gon was very, uh, of course, besides being the, the great uh, Tamil Chacham of his generation, but he had a keen understanding of words and phrases in the Torah. And he said that everybody's name could be found in the Chumash. And they asked him where his name was found. And he pointed to this Pasuk. Because um, his his uh, his name was Eliyahu ben Shlomo, so Evan Shalema, Aleph ben Shlomo. That's where he found his name, and that's why he named his sefer. Uh, and so, like, you see a lot of interesting things about this, where people's names were found um, in the Chumash. So, um, somebody wants, and they say also your name could be found, sort of, you could find it, or maybe in your parsha. Maybe that's where people pick names. Uh, for children, if it was found in the parsha the week they were born. So when one of my daughters was born, somebody said, "Oh yeah, your daughter's name. Maybe you know, where are you going to find it in the parsha?" It was Mishpatim. They said, "Yeah, Machashefa lo So I said, "I don't think we're going to pick that name, Machashefa." Um, okay, but so now, now I'm going to I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to go take it to the um Evan to the to the Kleyaker. Okay, let's see it. You see it there. Okay, let's get everybody to move that sign. Okay, fine. So this Klayakar, a little bit bigger. Lo yiyeh lecha b'kischa evan ve'evan g'dolak tana. Yesh ledaktik. Now, we'll spend some time going through it, but it's very, very much worth reading. And, and Baruch Hashem, uh, one thing I have to make you understand also is that for years and years, the the... The Klayakar only existed in the ancient versions of what's called Mikros Gadolos. So we had the, kind of like the older, with the older typeset and the older font and the, and the font and the typeset of the, of the Klayakar in the old Mikros Gadolos was horrible. It was like very poor Rashi script. Now we have all these laser printed, annotated, fixed versions. This is actually not from Mikros Gadolos. This is from an isolated volume where if you see clearly they have uh, Nikudos, as we grew up calling them, dots. And you have, uh, for instance, here where my cursor is hovering, like it gives you the, the source 
of where he's quoting and it has footnotes. So we're very, very spoiled today with how we learn things because we have these very sophisticated and clear versions. So it's, it's a big bracha uh, to have this exposed to the world because if you listen to, let's say, uh, some older shiurim from even from 30, 40 years ago or not, e not even that long ago, people say like, oh, you know, we don't quote this because like we didn't have access to it or we don't really know what it's referring to. And now we have so many things at our fingertips. Um, one literally doesn't even have to have a safer like during the week, you could do everything on a computer. You know, if you, I've mentioned before, if you look at hebrewbooks.org, thousands and tens of thousands of volumes at your fingertips, which is really, really interesting. Anyway, so here it goes to Kliyaka. Yesh ladakdeik. If you're going to say that person has one that's, let's say, a measure, that's, you know, let's say you have a pound, you have an ounce, one that's larger than it should be, or one that's smaller than it should be, you know, trying to tip the scales of balance, etc. And then he, he uses the big one for himself, and he uses a smaller one for others. He says, then we have a question. What does it mean you have to have a full and righteous measure for you? Because the shlema means like, if it meaning it should be complete, meaning that you have to complete that which was lacking, meaning it's referring to the one that was smaller than it should be. Meaning you have to fill that which was missing. That it has to be um, complete without any anything lacking. So what's referring to the one that's larger than it should be? He says it must be that the word vatsedek. There's two words that are described here. You have evan shlema, and you have to have something that is sedek. So if shlema, meaning it has to be complete, refers to the one that is lacking, so tzedek just has to be the one that is too much. He says tzedek is the opposite. This is, why, do I need, why do I need the word, the word shlema? So in other words, it doesn't make sense. Like what word is associated with which term? One that is greater, one that is smaller. He says, this is really what it means. That the first one, the large one, means that someone that's 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 measured properly. And the, and the smaller one is less than it should be. Everything is going on the smaller one. Again, it quotes the going to see here, like we have the annotation, the Gemara and Bava Basra, that it means. What does what tzedek mean? When I say tzedakah, we saw in last week's parasha, tzedek, tzedek, tirdov. What does tzedek mean? Righteousness. It means tzedek mishelcha v'tenlo. Give of yours and give to the other. Akein amar derech lo zu afzu. So this is what the, what the language is. Meaning like not only this, but this also. Evan shlema. When it talks about a full measure, u'bilticha seyreti alakha, and it should be lacking nothing. You shall not cause your neighbor or your other party to be lacking at all. And not only that, that you shouldn't have him lacking, but even Sedek, not only that, not only should he not be lacking, but with Sedek, you should give him even a little bit extra. If that's the case, so Lomar, and if that means that the larger one, which you have, that you're going to give him to have a little extra, and if that's the, the straight measure, so why does it say Lo hagadola? What does it say you shouldn't have in your possession even a larger measure? Yeshara. Why shouldn't you have it? We should have a larger one, which is measured properly, and from that you're actually going to give it a little extra. Why not? Vaod kasha, and furthermore, Why is this called Oseva? Why is this um, sort of uh, detestable in God's eyes? Why does it have to say that it's that it's kol um, osay ovel that it's not only it's detestable in God's eyes but anybody who does this terrible terrible thing? So you no, know, you're just trying to like what is the meaning of the verses? So the, you know this is a typical klyak or fashion. He asks a number of questions on all of the words and the verses, and now he's going to get to his point. 
He says, this is the, the, the way we explain this is the way Shlomo Melch, again, here we have, we say Shlomo, who Shlomo? Ah, from Mishlei. Shlomo Melech from Proverbs, Evan ve Evan, Eifa ve Eifa, Toavaz Hashem Gam Shneha, the Pasuk says. Stone, a measure. Uh, again, you had different types of measure. You have a flower measurement, you have a weight measurement. Um, he says, the, the, both of them are Toavaz Hashem, are sort of detestable in the eyes of God. What does that mean? Im Shnehem Shikriyim, Mahogam Shnehem, if they're both false, what does that mean? Both are are, are, are testable. How do we know to differentiate between them? Again, he's like just taking apart the Pesukim. We're talking about where somebody has a set of weights which are false, and he has a set of weights which are true. So we're showing that even the one that is correct is detestable, it's an abomination. Because it's the proper measure that is causing him to weigh with the improper measure. Because if he didn't have the proper one, he wouldn't have sort of like the baseline. He wouldn't know he would be afraid to use the fake one. Because everybody would come and they would find that they are missing. By the way, there's nothing, and, and it's a terrible feeling when you go somewhere and you order something and you're shortchanged, right? How many times has that happened where you ordered a certain quantity of something and the quantity is lacking? Or even if you ordered a certain weight or, or you know, when, when you look on the, on, the, on the packages, and I know it's what it says. It says this package is sold by weight, not by volume. And yet you open it up and you're expecting volume and all you get is weight. Okay, the classic example, I'm a big salad eater. I love salad, as you know. So my salad consists of a bag of potato chips. So if you open up a bag of potato chips these days and you know you have this nice big bag and there's like, you look and you have to like reach all the way down to get to it. Why? Because it says this package is sold by weight, not by volume. I'm not sure what they're weighing, but there certainly is no volume there, okay? So he says, when people are gonna come and they're gonna find that they're missing, the tovel of based in all of Tzakas Rabim Lomar. And they're going to go to take him to court. They're going to take him to task. And they're going to say, oh, he used a small measure on us. What are you going to say? And maybe you have something missing. You think everybody's missing? It's not possible. So what does he do? He tries to cover his tracks. Some people who do properly, he's not, he's not stupid enough to say, everybody, I'm going to give you missing a, a measure because everybody's going to come to you and say, like, what are you doing? But if I say some people get the proper measure and some people don't, and they're going to bring up to court, he's going to say in court, I said to so many people, I sell, I sell a product. And he's going to go to the ones that I gave properly and he's going to say, what do you mean? I got, I, I dealt fine. They're going to contradict the people who are complaining. He's going to say, no, you know what? The problem must be with you. The purchaser is not with the seller, right? This happens all the time. Somebody who's, who's um, careful in how he deceives people. He's not going to deceive everyone because if you deceive everyone, then what happens? Everybody's going to come against you and you're not going to have a leg to stand on. However, if you say, what do you mean? I have 500 positive Yelp reviews. How is it possible that I could be cheating you? You must be the outlier. The fact that you're complaining, you must be wrong. And by the way, this is, uh, you know, we have all types of terms for this today. Uh, I think one of the terms used is gaslighting, right? If you read that, look up the term gaslighting in today's, in today's media um, where, or, or, or where we blame the victim because somebody could be so strong in their position and they make it and like, no, it can't be. It can't be that I'm, that, you know, I'm, I'm cheating you. It must be that there's something wrong with you. And the person who got cheated actually gets cheated again because they can't even have a proper complaint. He says, He says, what do you accomplish? 
ונמצא שאלמלא הישר לא היה יכול למכור לכל המקטן, אבל הרי לקח הוא מעסק הישר כדי לעמס שקר שלו. לקח גם הישר את אוהב. So he says, this is why you have the proper measure and you have the improper measure. For if not, he wouldn't be able to cheat with only improper measures. He needs the proper measure to also deceive those others because it helps strengthen his position when people come to complain. This actually makes a tremendous amount of sense where somebody has not kulo sheker, but he has a lot of things that he does properly also because that gives him standing, it gives him a ground that when people come complain, he says, no, what do you mean? I'm an upstanding business, I'm an upstanding person. Vizel Shapeirish Rashi, this is why Rashi explains, Gedola hamachashas es haktana. It's, the, it's, the, it's the, the large one which contradicts the smaller one. Because on the, on, the, on the merit of the gedola, meaning the proper measure, he can contradict those who complain about those who got shortchanged. And therefore it says, it's, it's an abomination to God who do all of this. Klayaka continues on the next page. Amasha shakal beyushara. On those who, uh, who, 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 he uses those who uh, uh, use the proper measure. Gamze toeva, that's also an abomination. Because he's using proper measures to deceive those that he's improper. He's using one with the other. Okay, so that he, he has a very long-winded way of explaining the point, but even proper measure, if it's used for improper purposes, such as to deceive those who are not getting the proper amounts, it is just even though it's proper, but you're being it used for it's being used for nefarious purposes, equally both are considered toeva. Now he gets into the smichus, okay? This was all by explaining the psukim, but now he gets into what I wanted to, to, to really get into today. Now, he could have stopped right there, but he said, like, look, let's learn the chomesh, and we can also understand the smichus, the, which, which smichus means juxtaposition. I can understand now the juxtaposition of zechor es asher asalacha amalek, okay? So what does Rashi say? Rashi, Rashi quotes it here. Rashi says, Im If you are not honest about weights and measures, you're going to be worried about the enemy. Again, the Pasuk in Mishle says, those who use deceitful weights is, is despicable in the eyes of God. And it says right after that, one is see, if Mishle yet Aleph Aleph, and then it's Pasuk Beis is the next Pasuk. That comes the kind of like negative things are going to happen to you. And what is the connection? So why would the enemy come to you if you have no weights and measures? I mean, that's a good question. So if, if I had to ask you, before going further, if you had any thoughts, why is it that anybody would make a connection between enemies coming after you and dishonest weights and measures? If you had to think about that for a second, if you have any thoughts, share it or not. Or yes. Or not. Or not. It's a tough one. It's not like an obvious juxtaposition. I feel like Gail has something really smart to say. How about, how's that for putting you on the spot? I wish I, the only thing I can think of is if it's consistently bad behavior, it becomes the last straw for a bunch of people. And then they coalesce around the fact that you now have developed a reputation of being dishonest and they kind of all become your enemy. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. It's, it's hard to, I, I don't see a natural connection. Okay. I, I know, but it's, it's a tough one. It's not, not the easiest thing. Or I mean, he goes on to finish the question. He says, he says, <laughs> like, why did Amalek attack you? Did Amalek attack you because you were dishonest in business? I mean, they come saw on. weakness. They, they sense weakness. Right. If you're if you're strong handing somebody else, watch God's gonna make someone strong hand you. So it's kind of like a mida connected mida, a play on a play on words, really, by the way, because we say measure for measure, and literally we're talking about measure for measure. That because <laughs> you didn't measure properly, that's the word mida. Um, that's okay, that's a good thought. Well, let's see. Elevadai, elevadai. Kamur, 
He says, if you're using your measures to deceive others, what happens when someone is deceiving his fellow human being? Okay. Now, there's no question, like you have to have a certain sort of conviction within you that you have no problem hiding something from your neighbor. But what about vis-a-vis -vis God? Like, how does somebody like kind of work it out in one's mind that, okay, I get it, then I'm gonna get away with it that the customer will never know, but won't God know? So what do you have to say? So you have to say at a certain point that a person either doesn't care or doesn't think about it or kind of like pushes it out of his mind and says, you know what, God will never see. I think in some ways, human nature is we can rationalize God and, and kind of blurring the lines more than our neighbors and community. Okay, like Shabbos ends at nine, but like, yeah, if I eat 850, uh, it's close. And I think we sometimes rationalize that, or I, I can always speak for myself, I'll rationalize that more than if I deceive someone or would deceive someone that I know that I have to face in my own community. So that's my human nature, at least. Right. So maybe, so maybe the enemy realizes that God is going to pay these people back. And maybe one way they'll pay them back is by letting them fall to this enemy. Maybe. OK. Right. So he's so he starts off to say that somebody has shook up. In other words, he's actually like weighing this again. He doesn't mean the, the literal wing, but meaning somebody who's engaged in this activity. It's he's he's hiding. Mastira so many He's hiding his evil from human beings, and somehow he blocks out as if the eye in Shamala, the, the eye above, the eye in the sky, as if he's, he puts God out of his mind. And he says, This is how God acts. And also the Gemara and Sota says, He the story of the, of, of the Sota, why did the Sota have such public degradation? Because she did something in hiding that the media, the, the measure for measure is that um, God will cause her whole sin to be revealed. This is what we're saying to these deceivers. You are secretly stealing from your fellow human beings. God is going to make a public show of how you are going to be taken from. And therefore your sins, your iniquities, your uh, terrible behavior retroactively will be revealed. Because then you're going to know, everybody's going to know that secretly you accumulated wealth, which was not approved according to any standards. It's going to come sort of like with this, 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 great, this great presence. That's the enemy. They're going to come with such, you know, it's going to be so open. And therefore, your iniquities will be revealed. And he says, and this is what, and he continues, he proves this from the Medrash. The Medrash in B'Shalach says, and it quotes in the name of the Mechilta, Rabbi Eliezer Omer. It says in the, the story of when Amalek actually happened was in the end of Parshas B'Shalach. It says Amalek came, Shabab Gilui Ponim. They came with sort of revealed faces. What does that mean? He says, most time when people say Vayavo, it's sort of like kind of hidden. They were not, they didn't sneak up upon you. They didn't, you know, happen upon you. No, they came right in your face. Adkan Lashon. He says, this is a tremendous proof to what we're saying. Anything that the Jewish people did secretly, quietly, trying to hide from others, it gets exposed in the most public fashion. 
God does not do one justice without another reason. He says, that's why, uh, that, that, that because they did things so secretly to deceive their neighbors, he says, that's why Amalek comes. And he goes on and on and on and about, and, and by the way, isn't that always the case? That it's the, it's, and people always cloak sometimes the most heinous sins in tremendous righteousness. And when people do clearly bad things, what happens? People will say, oh, but he's such a tzaddik. He's such a bal chesed. He does tremendous things for the community. He does such wonderful things. How can it be a bad? But sometimes, and, and we lose sight of something that's like really a bad thing. We could give tens and tens of examples um, of this, but sometimes it's, you know, where we say like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The, all these types of aphorisms, because you know what? Uh, and, and I've come to a point, by the way, and I'm sure many of you reach this, this at some point in your life where, you know, when you hear stories or you hear kind of terrible things about people and you just kind of like, you can't be surprised anymore uh, that people get involved in certain things. So it's, um, and, that, and that's, this, this is the, the upshot of the, of the, of, of the clay car. I want to scroll down here to Rev Hirsch. I have time, I'll go into the, into... Um... Yeah, I just want to say, the only thing is, it, it kind of implies that everybody was, you know, dishonest. And I'm sure many people were not dishonest. And yet I'm all like came. Right. So it, it's hard to know. Does he mean that, that that's why they came originally? I mean, because like, when did they have a chance to be dishonest? Or is that saying going forward here, that that's the juxtaposition? I, I don't think, uh, it's an excellent question. I don't, I'm not sure he means that, when Amala came it's originally, direct, it was, uh, I think this is going forward, but if this is the type of behavior that you're going to take on, you're going to have a very public downfall. And look, um, I think that that if we we can look at it in our times, okay, the biggest the biggest scandal to hit the Jewish community in the last few years, of course, you know, we had the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of, of American, you know, American finance, Right. And how it affected the Jewish, the Jewish community. Right. But and, and that came about and, and look, look how many things were affected by it. Institutions, charitable institutions, universities, hospitals, and you know, the list goes on and on and on um, where someone's very and, and a lot of it was motivated by greed and people, you know, I, I can make this, I can make that, you know, and, and, and I know more about it than I'd like to even wish I knew. But um, the, 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 it had sort of an Amalek attack on the Jewish community in the eyes of the, of the whole world. And, you know, rules had to be changed and how institutions run themselves had to be changed and, 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 and all types of disclosures that we have to make. If you sit on a board, right, you have to now sign financial disclosures that you don't do business with other board members. Or if you do, you have to let it know what it is, you know, uh, things like that. And, and that was sort of like our, I think, this Evan the Evan Amalek moment um, in modern times. Let me, let me go uh, further to the, um, to the Rev Hirsch in a second. Let me just pull up one note here before I do that. Okay. Okay, this is, so this is Rav Hirsch. He says the, um, the very opposite to this picture of the national character of a people woven out of justice and duties of love, which only sees its power and its future in conscientious faithfulness to duty and through whose example the exclusive devotion to duty will ultimately in the future be participated in by the whole of mankind is presented by a great nation like Amalek. By the way, that's a really long sentence, but this is so Hirschian. Like if you read kind of, and the Hirsch didn't even write this. This is, this is a translation from the German. Uh, it, the the, the Hirsch Chumash that we have is done by Diane Grunfeld, who was like the Hirschian expert. Uh, but still it's like, you, you need to read, sometimes the sentences you need to read a few times to kind of like let it sink in, but you have to get the great point. He says, so this is presented by a great nation like Amalek, which only finds its strength in the might of its sword and its love of glory in treading down all unprepared weaker ones. They stepped out to oppose by the power of the sword, the first entry to the history of mankind of the people representing the victory of the power of the word. 
And right at this first attempt at opposition, its ultimate disappearance in the memory of man was proclaimed. So let's just see the second paragraph we'll discuss. If ever you forget your calling as Israel and your mission as Israel in the world and feel envious of the laurel wreaths which a deluded world weaves to crown the memory of successful victorious records of human happiness. That's just such a great line, you know? Uh, the, the, the laurel wreaths which a deluded world weaves to crown the memory of successful victorious records of human happiness and forgets the tear-soaked soil in which the laurel grew for such wreaths. Forget this not. When you yourself have to suffer under Amalek's coarseness and power, keep upright. Keep your humaneness and respect for that which is right even as your God has taught you. That is where the future lies. Humaneness and justice will remain the victors over brutality and force, and you yourself are sent to proclaim that victory and that future by your fate and example to be a co-worker in bringing it about. So he, he says it without saying it, kind of the, about the juxtaposition is that Amalek represents kind of everything that's wrong with the world and the entire story of the history of the world is one conquers another, stays around for a while, gets conquered by another, stays around for a while, conquers another, and the cycle goes on and on and on and on and on. What's truly everlasting, what's truly meaningful in the world? Virtue, decency, honesty. And how is that represented? And it's interesting that if the Torah should pick, if, you, if, I, if I had to ask you what's the one thing to pick um, in, in, to give one example of like, what's a virtue that a Jewish person should represent in the world? Anybody says Tikkun Olam, I'm throwing you off the uh, Zoom right now. Um, what's the one virtue that one should, should embrace, right? I'm not so sure we would pick honesty in business, but that's exactly, and, and I'm not gonna go through because it's, it's, it's a really small print, it's a long piece in the Nitziv, which is the middle part of the, of the handout. But if you have time, you wanna look through it. But he says that, you know, there's certain sort of like cardinal sins we have, you should murder that you, you, under any circumstance, you can't murder, and you can't have uh, illicit relations, and you can't worship idols, but they all kind of represent a lack of faith in God. And if somebody who is going to cheat in business and use dishonest weights, what they're saying is, is that I don't think God's going to provide for me. I don't think God's going to do the right thing for me, and I think I have to kind of help it along myself. I have to do it on my own, because I don't have faith in God. If you don't have faith in God, then that's a mullik. A Malik represents anything that's not faith in God. Faith in God, and, and this is, again, it's a very broad sort of understanding and, and, and type of existence where you have to live a life that despite the world around you, that all they want to do is believe is might is right. And we want to conquer and we want to get more and amass more and have more and do more and be more. We have to live a life of, it may be hard for us and we may be downtrodden and we may be in the minority, but we have to live a life of virtue. Keep upright, keep your humaneness and respect for that which is right, even as your God has taught you. And that's the lesson of Amalek, and that's the lesson of Eifot Tzedek, Vihin Tzedek. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal because, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, especially if we live kind of these capitalist lives. And by the way, the Torah is not telling you to be poor, and the Torah is not telling you not to go out and conquer the world in, in the business world. <laughs> no, 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 that's not at all. Is that we should take our talents and we should bring it to the world. And, and, and Baruch Hashem, we have for, for many, many generations, we should continue to do so. But not at the expense of decency. Not at the expense of, of what he calls humaneness. Not at the expense of following the law. And that's why it's a very important thing, which unfortunately gets lost on, on a huge segment of our community. And it's a big blight. It's a stain on, on, on our reputation is that people forget something called Dina de Malchus Dina, uh, that you have to follow the laws of the land in which you live also. You know, uh, you may not like it, but you have to pay taxes. You may not like it, but you have to follow the rules. You may not like pa 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 uh, and we can't just kind of go ahead and do our own thing. Part of being a humane people, part of being a foot is 
doing things properly and following things according to the letter of the law. Um, and, and anytime that that doesn't happen, unfortunately, it's followed by a Moloch type of situations. It may not be a physical enemy attacking you, but it could be, um, you know, terrible results and the way the world looks at us. But this, these, these two partials at the end are very much an indication of how we should present ourselves to the rest of the world as a moral, humane, uh, law-abiding, honest people. And if we could do that, uh, that's good. The Gemara and Shabbos says that when they go up to heaven, they're going to ask you a few questions. And one of the questions they ask you is, did you deal honestly in business? Okay. And it's one of the first questions. They don't ask you, did you daven three times a day with a minion? They don't ask you, did you eat Chal of Israel? And they don't ask you, you know, did you give to the UJA? I mean, th these are important things. But the, one of the first questions they ask you is, did you deal honestly in business? Did you have proper faith in God? And having proper faith means that I'll do what I'm supposed to do, even though I think I know better or I have, can cut a corner or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's the essence of this. So even though there's so much involved in Kiseitse, there's so many mitzvos here, but we can never lose sight of the macro. And the macro here gives us so much to think about. And again, it's super important, especially now before Rosh Hashanah, uh, when we think about our standing in the world. So if you do have time, look through the uh, the 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 hamak dover which is the nitziv um and, you know he talks about the big three uh but he says that a person should think that you know we we have to realize that we have to have faith in god so um yeah here we are getting close so everybody should uh, have a have a wonderful day and um uh, we will uh, see you guys next time thank you so much bye, bye.